Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome uh, to this webinar, Here and Now, HIV AIDS Activists Speak Out. Um, we, of course, are here today um, on World AIDS Day 2020, and I want to welcome our panelists um, and uh, all of you in the audience uh, to this, um, what I hope will be a really meaningful time together. I'm speaking in Los Angeles, and I wanna just say a couple of words about Outwards. Um, Outwards, the Outwards Archive was formed about four years ago to travel the country, recording the life stories of the pioneers and the elders of the LGBTQ civil rights movement. Um, over the past four years, we've recorded about 153 interviews in 27 states. And among those people that we've had the privilege of interviewing are the six panelists uh, joining us here today. Um, as you might imagine, back in the day, pre-COVID, we were able to travel to people's homes wherever they were in the country. Um, one of our panelists today, Elia Chino, is the one panelist who we have interviewed this year, and we were able to record her interview remotely, uh, sending her a, an equipment kit in Houston, Texas, so that we could gather her story, even though we did not have the privilege of being able to meet and sit with Elia personally or in person. So that's a little bit about Outwards. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that today is Giving Tuesday, a day of great generosity and support for nonprofit organizations all across the country. <clears throat> and if, as a re result of watching today's webinar, you are inspired to support the work of Outwards, we'll be sharing a screen with you again at the end um, with information about how you can donate. <clears throat> I wanna say a few more important words before we get started. As you probably know, <clears throat> it's becoming more and more common for organizations like Outwards to offer land acknowledgements in their programs, on their websites and so on. And we at Outwards believe this is a step in the right direction, the direction forward towards racial justice. And as part of that forward movement, a look backwards and an acknowledgement of the crimes against humanity that are part and parcel of our nation's origin story. <clears throat> we at Outwards acknowledge and regret those crimes against humanity, including but not limited to the forcible removal and genocide of the indigenous people who lived on this continent before white people arrived, the enslavement over centuries of millions of black men, women and children and the use of their lives and labor to build an economy that without this stolen labor could not have been possible, countless other crimes against people of color and the pervasive systemic racism that endures to this day. Here in Los Angeles, specifically where Outwards has its headquarters, we acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples. Our presence on this land is rooted in injustice and disrespect for the people who lived here and worked here before our ancestors arrived. Any acknowledgement of past injustices is only as relevant and credible as an organization's commitment to participating in the righting of past wrongs. Although our efforts are humble in nature and frequently flawed in their execution, Outwards is committed to this work. Last but not least, I personally and we as an organization are grateful for our lives, for the lives of our panelists and our moderator, and for the lives of all of you who have joined us on this sacred day, World AIDS Day 2020. Thank you for joining us and we welcome your comments. So the next thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna play a video um, that we've compiled to introduce you to our, our panelists. Um, and Andrew Lush, Andrew, do you wanna quickly come up from behind the curtain and say hello? Andrew is our technical director and editor, and he's the one who's gonna be making this whole program happen from behind the scenes. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you also to Ray McCarthy and Tom Bliss, our other devoted uh, staff members. Andrew is gonna roll a video. Um, and uh, that will introduce you to our panelists. And then um, from there, I'll come back on and I'll introduce our moderator and then we'll let things fly. So please watch um, and enjoy this about 13 minute video. I 
think it was 1988, um, my younger brother called me up one morning, early in the morning, and he said, um, it's a big A, sis. I remember um, crying all the way to my mother's house because back then, um, if you had an AIDS diagnosis, you were dying. That, that's all there was to it. In 1989, my best friend in Mexico City died. I find out like about one month later, two weeks later, and I said, wow, nobody told me, you know. But uh, in 1993, I went back to Mexico City. I went to his, his uh, mother, and uh, she told me, you know what, Gustavo that died from that horrible disease, poly AIDS. Take care of yourself. So I got this job where I was working in San Francisco, but I was still living in New York. In order to make that happen, I needed also an oncologist in, in San Francisco. So I was recommended to this very good uh, San Francisco oncologist. And I went the first time, the second time, the third time I went. He instead of having the test, which I always had the, the blood test done to plight leukemia, he said, come into my office. And he said to me, you, I cannot see you anymore, and you cannot come here anymore because I did a test and you're HIV positive. And to encounter someone telling me that he wanted me to come to the doctor anymore because I would contaminate everybody else's blood, That was a tough one. I was in shock, you know. Days, days. Then I come back to Houston. In that year, the my brother from Church of Christ, he died also. And I was talking about myself, oh my God, he never, he never told me that he was gay, you know. But back those days, you know, AIDS only was for gay people. You know, that's what the people were saying. When I discovered that these two very important persons on my life, they died from AIDS, that when I was starting in my mind, I need to do something about it. And that's when I, when I started putting the pieces, the words for the Latin American Foundation for against AIDS. There was another woman, Carol LeFevre, who was a lesbian who um, I had uh, helped with an intervention for her a couple of years before that. And she came to me that same, around that same time and said, I have AIDS, what are you going to do about it? There were no services, uh, no prevention services, um, let alone any direct services um, like housing or, case management, or any of those things for uh, Native Americans. And, uh, but no, nobody did. Nobody picked up that work. I am not a person that will sit and not think of what to do to make this better. So I said, oh my God, I, I mean, I like painting and drawing and all that, so I started. So it was a new thing that I had to learn. And I put myself on a state of mind that it was like going back to school and I was going to learn. And that was incredible because all of a sudden I started to live again. We created a housing complex for people living with AIDS. Um, we have a variety of services and uh, youth theater, which I created in 1990. We didn't know nothing about theater. We just knew that storytelling was an um, important part of our culture and was an important uh, way to get the message to youth, especially about um, HIV prevention. And, and so we had to go back and think of, well, what is healthy sexuality in our community? Um, what, what is um, um, a way that we can grieve these losses that we've had in a way that's part of our culture as opposed to Kubler-Ross or... Um, anybody else. And so we had to go and do all those um, research and 
Um, there were many spiritual um, elders in the community who worked with us and, and helped us along that path. Project FIRE was a HIV AIDS prevention, hot, horny, healthy for men, wet, wild, well for women, in which we talk about ways that people can have safer sex. And that was in 1990. In 1992, we also started the Fireball. We call it the Fireball because we also had categories within the Fireball where the houses would compete for presenting a safer sex message in the context of the ballroom scene. And we had, the first one that we had was in April, no, it wasn't April, February of 1992. And there was a snowstorm. And I couldn't believe that we would still have this ball. And they kept telling me the children will show up, the children will show up. At nine o'clock, uh, eight o'clock, there were very little. At nine o'clock, there was very little. At 11 o'clock, the place had about 800 people in there in the middle of a snowstorm. I will never forget one thing that one of my friends said at a meeting when I was going to an HIV, hot, horny, healthy workshop. And what he said was that when you have a person from a poor background and you're telling them to think about how they have sex, when they have sex, and where they have sex, you're taking away the one freedom that they felt that they had because of their economic condition. The one thing that they could do is I have my body. And now you're telling them that you don't even have that. My doctor told me in, two, in May of 2001, he recommended that I leave work because the way my body was reacting to the virus and even with the meds, the you know, chronic fatigue that I was having and the other issues I was having physically, that I was under way too much stress for me to stay healthy on the long term. And I ignored him. I had never felt more uh, validated in my career in my life. I was doing things that were, I felt were really important. And, um, and I loved what I did. I loved it. So I ended up in a situation where I worked myself into the ground again. But you know, towards the end there, I can remember sitting at my desk and literally being in tears because I could no longer keep up with the demand and I didn't know what to do. And I called my sponsor and I still have a sponsor in program. She's been my sponsor for 20 some years. And I started whining to her about, you know, um, you know, I, my, my life was my job and I made a difference in the world. And she said, honey, I have something to tell you. I said, it's just not going to be easy to hear. You used to be important and now you're not get over. I went out and got the tattoos on my hands that day. <laughs> I'd always been tattooed. I've been tattooed, heavily tattooed since I was a young man all over my body. But I didn't have any tattoos that showed when I worked in the corporate world. And that day I went out and got the tattoos on my hands. And I haven't looked back. I had developed a, a, you know, a couple of buildings in, in Harlem. Um, and because I was learning that... Um, some of my neighbors actually had become homeless um, when they developed AIDS and couldn't pay their rent and got evicted, you know, from their apartment, um, either because they didn't pay their rent or because of, of AIDS phobia. Um, I wanted to use my housing development skills to try to create some housing for people who were becoming homeless. People were literally sleeping in the streets, in parks, under bridges, um, you know, in subway tunnels. And so since the city's approach was to let people live in the street, we decided let's create an AIDS housing street-based um, center right in front of Housing Preservation and Development, the, the city offices uh, for housing. And so we took my pickup truck and a friend's van and started going around the city on bulk pickup night to pick up furniture that apartment buildings had put out when it was being discarded by, by their, their tenants. You know, we literally, 
shipped all of the furniture that we eventually collected, you know, in the, the van and the truck, uh, set up living rooms and, and bathrooms and, and uh, even like some, some, some kitchen, an old stove in the middle of the street and chained ourselves to it, you know, parked the van on one end of the block, the pickup truck on the other end of the, the block and, you know, literally made the city have to like bring tow trucks to tow the vehicles away, bring uh, devices to cut the, the chains off of us to get us off the furniture. It took so long for the city to, to have to mobilize all of those things that we were, you know, on the five o'clock, the 5.30, the six o'clock news, uh, uh, you know, with a story of AIDS activists protesting the lack of medically appropriate housing, uh, blocking traffic in lower Manhattan. So um, our demand was for a 20, $25 million capital fund to create medically appropriate housing. And ironically, within two weeks, the the mayor's office, you know, matched that uh, that demand. And a couple of weeks later, the governor of of New York, then then um, Mario Cuomo, um, matched it as well. So you know, we mobilized fifty million dollars of capital funding for the creation of AIDS housing just from that demonstration. We don't we don't spend a lot of time talking to the youth we work with about the problems in the neighborhood, they see it every day, but we can't help them to um, become um, people who are the solutions to the problems. We as a planet need to realize that we have to do whatever it takes to teach the f future generations acceptance and compassion and to behave in ways that I help each other. To be a trans woman, to be an immigrant, to that doesn't speak English, you know, uh, all those kind of things okay, that also never, never let anybody to put you down. I put my energy more and more into as time progressed in my life to saving people from HIV. That became my new work. I've been through too much in my life to not be who I am in the world. It's not worth it for me to hide any portion of myself anymore. Too many people died horrendous deaths not to have something positive come out of that their deaths and the community response that you know is now giving people life uh, welcome back thank you for uh, watching that video with us um, we are now going to be progressively welcoming our uh, extraordinary panelists. I see Doc Duhan's camera has opened up. Um, I'm going to put myself in the gallery view. Um, I see Elia Chino, welcome from Houston. Um, I see Sharon Day in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and James Creedel in Newark, New Jersey. I see Juan Manuel Alonso in a town in New Mexico um, in the mountains. Uh, and I see Eric Sawyer in New York. Uh, and last but, last but not least, I see uh, Jason Walker, um, our moderator for this panel. Um, again, I wanna say thank you to the panelists for being here today. And I just wanna briefly introduce uh, Jason. Uh, Jason Walker is an incredible voice on the forefront of the queer liberation movement, which Jason understands so well, is inextricably linked and cannot be separated from the liberation of any marginalized, invisibilized, or subjugated person or group in society. Jason serves as Senior Coordinator of Grassroots Advocacy at Health Gap, leading the organization's movement for universal HIV treatment access. And prior to that, Jason worked with Vocal New York, a statewide grassroots organization building power among low-income people directly impacted by HIV AIDS, the drug war, mass incarceration, 
and homelessness. And we are very, very grateful to welcome Jason to moderate this panel. I am going to step out um, and I just wanna say thank you again to all of you who have joined us both in the audience and on the panel. I look forward to going into the audience and, and uh, watching uh, the wonderful discussion that I'm sure will ensue. So with that, thank you all so much and welcome Jason. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me to host uh, this conversation um, and to moderate this conversation with such an amazing panel who has a wealth of information, knowledge, wisdom, and strength, quite honestly, um, for enduring um, in, in times of chaos and times of, of hardship. Um, so, you know, with conversations like this, it's, it's very difficult to, to figure out, okay, where exactly do we begin um, to kind of like start to this discussion on World AIDS Day during the midst of, a, of another global pandemic that has been impacting um, uh, countless numbers of folks. So for me, I think like the best place to start this conversation is if each panelist can just talk a little bit about um, how they, where they are right now. Like, how are you feeling um, at this current time? of uh, another global pandemic and just like, just a community check-in on like how folks are feeling and where folks are at. And, um, and we can just start, I'm, I'm gonna just start to my left here with Doc. And then if Doc, you could just pass it off to the next panelist so we can have a, a flow like that. Very well. Um, thank you, Jason. I'm feel, I feel privileged to be involved with this tonight. Um, it's, World of AIDS Day is always a very contemplative day for me. Uh, I was sitting talking with my hus husband at dinner about the things we've been involved we've been involved with over the years and the people we've lost and it's a uh, it's a day for retrospection for me and I'm really grateful to be here to be able to participate in this um, I'm doing well um, I'm I've been very careful about dealing with the COVID issues and making sure that I'm I'm being a responsible citizen and making sure that I'm following the science and not the politics. Uh, and, and that hasn't been always, that hasn't been entirely easy. I've, I have been actually quite amazed uh, and disappointed by the fact that we had a we had a lesson that was taught us about making sure that we knew what was going on to the best of our abilities from a scientific standpoint in the 80s and the 90s. And as a, and my background is the sciences, um, not medical sciences, but the sciences in general. And I am I've been shocked that we have so many people who aren't willing to pull together to take care of each other in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we had learned some lessons in the 80s and the 90s, and it doesn't seem it doesn't seem that we have. And I want to leave on a negative note because I think there are a lot of people that are seeing this as an opportunity to change that. I'm grateful for that, um, but I would re I have re would really I really believe that we need to come together to take care of each other. And if there was ever a time when it was obvious. Um, now is the time. Um, thanks. Thank you. Can, can you pass it off to um, one of your other colleagues? Me? Okay. Um, how about Elia? Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for this uh, opportunity. For me, it's just a bless to be here today uh, because um, I just want to talk about 30 years ago, okay, when this pandemic, um, the HIV pandemic was arising across the globe, uh, kill uh, people infected, dying from HIV and AIDS. I, it was a very tough times that we don't have with this technology back that day, that years. I just remember that uh, we did everything on the streets. Uh, providing literature, providing information, uh, doing fundraising to barrier or brothers and sisters that was dying in friends' houses, that was dying in apartment of friends, but at least with a family. 
because the stigma and the discrimination about the subject of HIV and AIDS, it wasn't easy, but it's been a long way. And we are still, and I'm here, but I, I'm a miracle to be here today because now we're facing the, the, uh, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. And I was also affected by that pandemic, but I'm still alive. And I believe that God has purposes for me to continue alive. Um, and three years ago, so I was dying from cancer or lymphoma. Uh, I, that's, what, that's what I believe that I'm really, really very blessed. And, I, and God had me here because everything what I do, I do from the bottom of my heart to helping other people that I, they don't have all. Uh, and thank you for, to have me here today and this day, World Lace Day, for me is so important because uh, AIDS brought me to this arena to go and help our brothers and sisters, to give them hope and to give them uh, source resources and education to the community underserved and the marginalized community, the LGBT community, that's the most key uh, populations around the globe. I pass it now to James. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, it has been a very long and difficult journey. Uh, my work with HIV began in 1982 when I was a member of uh, Black and White Men Together, which is MACT, later became Men of All Colors Together, New York. And I was going to New York from Newark uh, every Friday night for a meeting to talk about the issue of racism, sexism, and homophobia in the gay community and in our lives. And in 1982, I'm a, a Vietnam veteran and a friend of mine who, uh, who worked at another institution, his uh, girlfriend's sister uh, had a doctor who wanted to become part of a research team looking at the issue of HIV and its effect uh, with uh, gay men in New York. Obviously at that time, it was not known as HIV. That only, that came uh, four years later. Uh, my uh, currently, uh, it's been uh, a long, long haul. I'm currently married and back in, um, February, uh, actually March, my husband and I uh, had a little bout with what we thought was a little flu bug. And as it turned out, his was a little more um, difficult than mine, but we survived it. And in October, we went for a doctor test and we found out that we both have antibodies to COVID. So apparently that was when we contracted the COVID virus. So like you, uh, I feel blessed that I'm here still alive and still functioning in this world. Uh, but I look back on the time that like this president allowing people to die, that Reagan did the same thing. And he became an American hero. And that pains me that so many people think of him as a hero when in fact, he cared less about people who were dying in this nation. And it took a long time for us to get on our feet to work toward helping each other survive the pandemic of HIV at the time. And now, hopefully, with the change in administration, we have an opportunity for people who really care about us as human beings to begin to do the work that needs to be done so that people will not die needlessly. As I said, I'm a Vietnam veteran, so 
death has been all around me and I feel pain because of that. And someday I look forward to an opportunity when it is not so prevalent part of my life. Doc, uh, you talked already. Jason, uh, Eric, how about you? Oh, thank you so much, James. Um, you know, World AIDS Day is always a really strange day for me. Um, you know, having been an AIDS activist most of my life, uh, I just think back on the, you know, dozens and dozens of my friends who have all died of AIDS and uh, about how strange it is for me to have survived all these years. I keep asking, you know, why, why am I alive and why have they all died? And uh, I worked for a long time also for the United, Na a United Nations AIDS programs. And because of the global work that I've done uh, to try to get treatment to people in the developing world, I've lost so many, many friends from developing countries uh, who didn't have access to healthcare, who didn't have access to prevention information, who didn't have access to medications uh, to save their lives. And here I'm now living for almost four decades with AIDS. And I, I just think it's so unfair. And uh, I think about health equity and the lack of justice uh, in the world, especially uh, with relationship to health. Uh, you know, HIV has taught us so much about uh, how to fight diseases and about public health in general. Uh, and if we take the lessons that we've learned from HIV, you know, we know that people need to have accurate information about um, infectious diseases to know how to protect themselves. They need to know what the risk is of getting uh, diseases, about how they can modify their behaviors to make themselves less at risk. They need to know information about prevention uh, modalities. For AIDS, it's condoms and clean needles, but for COVID, it's uh, you know, masks, it's social distancing, uh, it's, you know, so many, so many things. Um, and, you, you know, I think about like President Trump who came down with, with COVID and in a few days he was like miraculously so much better because he had access to, you know, antibody tests and, and antiviral drugs and, uh, you know, steroids and, and so many things that are cutting edge uh, treatments for COVID uh, that, you know, the average person around the world doesn't have access to. And it reminds me of that lesson about, you know, the lack of uh, health equ equity. And I, I just, you know, really hope that uh, we as a society, uh, you know, take the lessons we learned from HIV, apply them to diseases like COVID to ensure that everyone has, you know, personal protective uh, equipment to Eric, um, maybe I can unmute you. Eric, you went on mute. Uh, so I, I'm not sure why that happened, but I, you know, I just hope that um, that you know we take the lessons we learned from HIV and apply them not only to COVID, but uh, you know, to all diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, you know, Ebola. I mean, everyone has a human right to health. Everyone has uh, a right to know how to protect themselves from diseases. Uh, and what we need to do is to try to make the world a fairer place, a more just place where people have uh, an opportunity uh, to protect their own health and the global health of others. I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, sir. Can you pass it to um, one of your fellow panelists? Uh, uh, let's see, Sharon, uh, you haven't spoken yet. Are you? Would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, good evening. Um, happy to be here tonight. Uh, and um, here in, in, in Minnesota, and uh, it's interesting, just a little over a year ago, I was in uh, New York City. Um, it was uh, in, a, in a play and theater in New York City, and um, I left the I left there in February, and came home. And within a couple of months, two of the actors I was uh, in this play with were um, have died from from COVID. 
uh, two Native uh, American men. And I think about you know where we're where we're at today, and um, we, we're dealing with you know at least a couple of epidemics, um, besides um, HIV, and that is uh, COVID. And in Minneapolis, um, when I came home shortly after, in March there was a shutdown, and then um, uh, and then um, within. Um, in May, uh, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. And, um, and I, I think there are about 13 states, um, and I'm not sure how many counties across the country have declared racism a public health epidemic. And um, you don't have to uh, go very far in South Minneapolis um, to see the devastation um, that has taken place in the, in the uprising by the young people. And, uh, you know, we still have about 200 buildings that were burned and we have um, the post office, the police station, you know, they're, they're, they haven't even cleaned up the rubble. Um, and, you know, it's it, um, back in 1987, uh, when I started um, working with people living with AIDS, um, one of the things that was the hardest to deal with was um, the denial, uh, denial that um, denial and ignorance about um, HIV, and and that's pretty much what we're dealing with today is um, denial by all the people who refuse to wear masks. Um, refuse to do social distancing, uh, refuse to um, uh, to uh, in that go visit their uh, relatives and um, you know and so that's really what's 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 fanning this. But I believe that um, you know we have um, we've had a bit of a. Um, outbreak of HIV in South Minneapolis. Since March, we've had 27 cases and uh, most, most of them Native Americans. And that really is as a result of um, um, and opioid um, addiction, homelessness. And these are all things that are, um, you know, um, you know, that, that, that poor people deal with. And um, uh, we've had uh, encampments and um, we've had them again this, this summer and this fall. And, you know, I think there's something like 700 people that the county is um, putting up in hotels. Um, and so, so all of these things, you know, have created this environment where HIV can, um, uh, uh, where we can have this outbreak. So um, there's still so much work to do and uh, um, it's sad to see um, what we could have learned um, from other um, epidemics and could apply them to this. But, you know, we had again, um, you know, a president who did not care you know, like who did not care about us. And, um, and so that's where we're at today. So we still have a lot of work to do. Um, and hopefully, you know, there may be a, a light at the end of the tunnel with these um, vaccinations and, um, and um, with, um, you know, leadership that says this is real, um, wear a mask, social distance, wash your hands. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, um, Juan. Yeah, and Juan, if you could be just a little bit more um, brief on this so we can get to a little bit, um, some discussion questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> since last January, we have been in lockdown due to the fact that we were on a long trip and the crew on the inform us there was a virus coming 
They didn't tell us why. So as soon as we came back to California, we closed the house and came to the forest in New Mexico just to be safe because being positive, having had cancer, having had, you name it, and I also have to survive it, I am petrified of even being near anything that has to do with other people, even though it's, I wear a mask and I wear, wash my hands and social distance and all, everything like that, but it's still, it's, it's a scary thought of becoming positive due to the fact that I have already many people that I know that have passed away and I'm not ready to go. I have too much to pay. <laughs> uh, as an individual, I believe that not only consciously through my art, which is what I do, um, I put conscious, subconscious messages in it. And I'm aware that we need it, all of us to work together, to achieve a place where we all can live, where there's no colors and no race and no, no inequality, that males and females are totally equal and that we're treated with respect, which is not much to ask. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you. And I'm really honored to be here with the rest of you uh, because we have been going at it for a long time. And as an HIV survivor since early 80s, it hasn't been easy. And it's something that we all need to work at, you know? And it's not that difficult. It's the same, wear a condom, Wear a mask. It's that simple. You know, to prevent catching it or giving it to somebody else. It's that simple. And it's something that it, people should have known. We have the AIDS epidemic in the 80s and we learned that we have to wear a condom. Now, it's as simple as wearing a condom, just put a mask on. And it's... it's I have been spoken back by reminding people in public to wear a, con uh, wear a mask. And some lady told me to kiss her ass. And I uh, said to her, if you were a lady, maybe I would, but you're not a lady. And I, since that moment, I haven't mentioned to anybody else because I don't want to encounter arguments with people. And it's not who I am. Um, about yes. equality and one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, also, a reminder uh, to our, our attendees to please, if you have any questions um, for our panelists, uh, please use the Q&A function um, found at the bottom of your Zoom window. So submit any questions or like comments um, that you would like us to share. Um, so my next question is, you know, I, I continue on with the theme of like lessons learned. Um, and it sounds like there were lessons that we need to like learn as a community, folks who are impacted by, uh, by pandemics. Um, one of the things that I have known and learned about from doing AIDS activism work was the development of community care and support, right, um, that was found um, just inspired from community because of the lack of government action. Um, similarly, there were some like mutual aid programs started. I want to say I'm based in New York, so I know some of them happened in New York around community care. Um, what are some, and you see mutual aids, folks providing food for the elderly. Um, what are other like things that we have seen that are similar in how we have shown up for each other as community? And what are some ways in which we can do better? and how we could show up for community um, as we go um, through another pandemic. I hope that question is clear. I'll, so, I'll, take, I'll take a shot at that. Um, I, as, as folks were speaking tonight, I, 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 I was thinking back 
to the period between like 84 and 88, which is when I became involved uh, in, in, in HIV work and in being involved with, with what was going on in the community. And during those years, we were lost. Those were new. I was living in a, in a medium-sized community. And even in the cities, even in Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, there was so much confusion. There was so much, um, there was so much misinformation that, you know, looking back retrospectively, it looks like we had a, a logical path. But at the time, we knew very little. It was very hard. And what ended up happening was people's voices got louder and louder because the government was not paying attention to us. And as they got louder and louder, we started to organize ourselves because nobody else would. That's the corollary I see here. The, we, in, we in this country have got to organize, have to be angry and organize ourselves to help our neighbors and to help our communities because government's not doing it. They're not taking the lead. They're not taking the initiative. There, there's limited, there are limited actions here and there that are not coordinated on a national level. And so this is a time for the, the people who are involved, who, have, who, have, who are concerned to take that, the anger and the passion that is arising from the loss of 265,000 people so far and turn it into a way of addressing the needs of the community. In my case, what that means is support of the local food bank. There are a lot of people who are out of work. There are people who can't afford to, there are people who need to stay home, who can't afford to stay home. They have an elderly pa parent in the house or they themselves have a, have a, a condition that makes, it, makes them an extreme liability, extreme risk for them to be out in public. And they go anyway. They go anyway because otherwise they don't eat. So this is a time for me to take what we learned during the AIDS crisis and solidify that and use it as a template for bringing action and change into our community. And we, everybody can do it a different way. That's what ended up happening in the early years of AIDS. Everybody took a different, era, took a different angle. And in, 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 the, in the mainstream, we, had, we ended up being successful. Thanks. I want to kind of like follow up with another question to the panelists. Um, Cause you made an excellent point of how like there was anger and rage uh, because of lack of inaction. Um, and from like, you know, a little bit of my history that I've been lo looking at that, you know, people living with HIV AIDS in, you know, our community um, also had to be their own experts. Um, and, you know, I, uh, if folks can talk a little bit more about how um, our community had to become their own scientists, right? Had to become their own expert. If someone could like talk a little bit about that and if there are any like parallels to that in, in, in a COVID world. I'm not sure if there are any parallels in the COVID uh, world, but my experience was uh, with the house community of Greater Newark. And for those of you who don't know the house community, the house community uh, made up of uh, lesbian and gay men, mostly gay men of color, who were support, who created a support system for younger gays, uh, men and lesbians in the community, particularly those who were ostracized by their family, thrown out of their homes because they dare to say that I'm gay. And the house community created um, a ball scene for competition. And those ball scenes allowed for 
opportunity for their, the youth and those in the houses to compete against each other. And when I first met the, the house community of Greater Newark, I saw the potential for them to come together and to do presentations within the ball scene around HIV AIDS prevention. And for the first time, the houses of Greater Newark came together and created the fireball in which the competition was around prevention issues, or ways of preventing HIV and to educate each other and to be their own survivor, to be a way of creating for themselves a life and an opportunity to, to uh, not allow the HIV situation to limit them. And we were very proud of the house community for doing that because the house community by and large were so competitive that they never came together to do anything. And so that was a lesson learned that when you're in a major issue facing your community, if you can come together and allow and not allow uh, the competition that you have for each other to destroy the opportunity to work together, then you can be successful. And we were successful in saving lives that way. And so uh, that history is something that members of the house community carry forth in terms of their daily lives. And they were able to go into other arenas in the community and be successful. I think there's one parallel uh, with HIV prevention and COVID prevention that was you know, quite evident in New York City. Uh, some of it was uh, led by uh, Housing Works, an organization I, I helped start uh, that that video about the demonstration in front of HPD, all, the, uh, all of us cha cha changed the furniture was about. But um, a group was mobilized by Housing Works and some other HIV uh, service organizations that took personal protective materials, uh, especially masks and uh, gloves, uh, and went on street corners, went into the subway system to distribute those to people who weren't wearing masks, to you know, tell, to pass out uh, you know hand sanitizer, so let people know, hey, there a way to prevent yourself from getting infection is to wear a mask, to social distance, to wear gloves, to wash your hands, wash your hands, use sanitizer if you can. Uh, and uh, I, you know, in addition to that prevention technique, uh, there was one thing that a number of uh, HIV housing organizations like Housing Works did uh, was they band together, they approached uh, the mayor of New York and they approached the hotel and said, hey, look, homeless people are really at risk for COVID. Uh, people who are in the shelter system are really at risk for, for COVID. There's lots of hotel rooms that are not being used uh, because there's no tourists. Uh, why can't we match the over, uh, you, the over uh, supplied and lack of uh, customers in hotels to the homeless people uh, who are either ill or at risk of COVID and put some of the people from the shelters, some homeless people with HIV into those unused uh, hotel rooms. Uh, and that actually happened. Uh, and it's something that I think shows learning lessons from HIV and applying them to an illness like COVID. Um, I just want to say one of the things that we're, that we're doing is like really using um, social media and um, texting to get people like into COVID tests, um, help them get through that process really quickly. And of course, distributing PPE and, and food and so on. But, what I, I, but I wanna go back and say that the one parallel between um, HIV and COVID is that if you are a person of color and uh, you get COVID, um, uh, you're, you're more likely uh, to die and that's exactly what happened um, with HIV as well. Um, and st still today, 
if you're a native person um, and, and you know, you may, um, uh, you know, you may access um, services and, and um, you know, have a virus load that's undetectable. Um, but um, that's only true for about half of the native people who are, who are positive. And so, so the same thing is happening over again. And that has not changed in, in 30 years. And that is, um, you know, there still are not, um, they're, they're, the health disparities are there. And if we get sick, you know, like if white person gets sick, um, you know, they're probably going to be okay. But if you're black or indigenous or, or um, Latinx, you know, um, you're, you're, you're going to be sicker because of the health disparities. And that's, you know, I, and I keep waiting, you know, like all these years for, you know, like the gay community to talk about like uh, universal health care for everyone, you know, to do something about these disparities. Um, it, you know, um, so and that, that's that, I'm sorry, still has not happened. So we need to, um, you know, that needs to that needs to happen. I really thank you for that. That certainly is something that I have thought about uh, all of my life, uh, from 1982 when I was uh, having those conversations around racism in America. I did that for 10 years, and you're definitely right that the gay community has a big disappointment when it comes to dealing with issue of racism and sexism in America. And we have a long way to go, still a long way to go. And what's so painful about it is that one would think that as gay people, having the experience of being discriminated against, you would learn something from it. And a way of learning that, of showing that you've learned something from it is to act differently, to behave differently, to fight differently in support of those who've gone through what you've been through. So I thank you for that. Um, on to this, I want to continue this conversation about um, historically marginalized communities, communities of color, um, and like queer communities, trans folks. Um, can we, like, are there any parallels between the HIV AIDS pandemic, drug users, sex workers, right? Um, homeless folks. Um, are there parallels? I know, and, and Eric, you talked a little bit about like the parallels between like homelessness and marginalized groups, but are there any other like clear parallels between how governments, um, has um, uh, how government has responded and acted um, to support communities who have historically um, been situated to the margins or the fringes? Well, I, I think we have seen that uh, the, the, the administration that's in charge of Washington right now uh, is basically behaving the same way as the Reagan administration uh, behaved. And James spoke very eloquently about that uh, before. Uh, you know, it, it seems that the rich, white, empowered, uh, uh, entitled uh, people in charge of areas that are predominantly white, uh, you know, are not believing uh, any of the real scientific information about COVID. Uh, they're not taking COVID seriously. They're not uh, taking the need to wear masks or socially distance or, or uh, anything. Uh, the, the only governments that seem to be responding uh, appropriately are often largely democratic uh, cities, uh, states, uh, but they tend to be um, cities and states where there are uh, diverse populations where there are are lots of black and brown and and uh, trans people and and uh, lots of homeless people and lots of Native Americans and where the need for um, more social equity uh, in healthcare in care and support in uh, programs uh, such as like food. Uh, uh, security and, and other programs to support people um, who, uh, you know, not are not earning um, a fair daily wage 
are, are put in place. You, you, you know, you look at um, governments that, that provide um, enhanced um, welfare payments, enhanced, um, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the, the term now, uh, unemployment uh, programs. You know, those tend to be democratic uh, programs in cities and states uh, where there is diversity, where there is an understanding uh, that we need to do more for, for people. Uh, and it's really frustrating that, um, you know, our, our president, uh, entitled Republicans uh, in charge of the Senate uh, at, or entitled governors uh, are not um, meeting the needs of, of their people. Uh, that wasn't very articulate, sorry. No, we got it. We that got was it. good, yeah. It was clear. Yes. Um, so we have a question from the audience. Um, this question is, um, many of the advocates who have continued HIV work are pivoting to lead COVID science advocacy. It is possible that today's hate mongering and self-interest preservation keeps us, from, keeps us from calling on a different response from media or government. It is possible that LGBT folks were already organized because they were oppressed and we may not find similar organizing because there is no common cause. Any responses to that? I can read that again. I, 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 yeah, so I, I, I'd like to answer. Yes. Yes, I'll read one more time. Um, so many of the advocates who have continued HIV work are pivoting to lead COVID science advocacy. Is it possible that today's hate mongering and self-interest preservation, self-interest slash preservation keeps us from calling a different response from media or government? Is it the divisions among us that keeps us from that? Um, it, is it possible, second part question, is it possible that LGBTQ folks were already organized because they were oppressed and we may not find similar organizing because there's no common cause? Pretty loaded question there. Um, but yeah, so the first part I would like want fo uh, folks who are, are um, feeling uh, to respond um, is it possible that hate mongering and self-interest preservation keeps us from calling a different response from media or government? I'll, I'll take a real quick shot at that. Um, hate, hate mongering was at the point at which we were dealing with this in the 80s, the hate mongering was a structured part of society. People had inherent prejudices and hates towards people of color, towards transgender people, towards gays and lesbians. That was a structured part of society. It was a given. A big part of what we're seeing now is not a given. A big part of what we're seeing now is induced. And it's partly the media encouraging yes. the politicians and the politicians themselves splitting, splitting the American public, splitting the public in, in, into, into factions in order, to, um, in order to achieve political ends without any concern for the virus or the death it's causing. So anyway, that, that's my view on it. And you were so right to point out that the politicians and the media are playing a major role in a lack of an adequate response uh, be because of the uh, Republicans who are, uh, you know, continuing, especially Donald Trump at the top, uh, to discount COVID is not a serious problem. Uh, initially, to say it's just going to go away magically, uh, and to uh, not put in sound scientific based prevention of modalities like wearing etc uh, and then the media parroting uh, you know their inappropriate messages uh, 
you know, have contributed largely to an inadequate response. Um, I have two final questions. Yes, and I don't know how to do any of this, so I'm quiet because I have nothing. I have a lot to say, but I don't know how to get into the screen. You're on the screen. We see you. Oh, we can okay. hear you too, Juan. What we have to be aware is, oh, okay. What we have to be aware is that it's it's what's happening is a callous decision of the government to create a certain kind of division where it has between Republicans and Democrats. And what I'm aware of and I have noticed is that Republicans refuse to wear masks, including my family. And the Democrats are more willing to accept, but not. We're facing what happened with AIDS, what happens when the law for wearing a seat belt happened. Nobody wants it to wear a seat belt. We are encountering this at the same time. And the COVID, what people are not aware of that is transmitted through air. And we must wear a mask. It's that simple. Watch your hands, keep a distance. And until the new administration comes into terms, we're going to be at a war with government because there are not clueless, they're there to fill their pockets, which is what they have been doing. And we have our wonderful country have come down to a banana republic. And that is unacceptable. And we have to do whatever it takes for whatever means to unify our country in order for the job to be done and for having a center point that makes a rules and the laws and you're not allowed to go out. And if you get, take, if you are out and you have no reason to be out, you have to be summoned a ticket. And that's the only way people are gonna understand that this is a serious situation that we're encountering as much or even more than what the HIV uh, was. Because HIV, we as a community learned that we needed to protect every single one of us when we went to have sex, which it was wearing condom, even if you were in the rambles at the park, you know? And by having those simple things done, we'll be able to somehow manage the insanity that has been created by our government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just two more it questions. makes me angry. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question. It's a tough one. So, um, well, it's tough to pick between two. Um, but I think this one is gonna be important because of the, the time. Um, I remember last year during this season, um, I saw a documentary called 5B about um, uh, the fifth floor of a hospital in San Francisco. And they talked about how the importance of touch was radical um, in the lives of folks who were seen as untouchable and deemed to be untouchable. Um, learning that lesson of touch, how do we, how are we able to touch each other now during these times? And what does touch look like for us as a community where we have found historically that touch had to be the most radical form of ways in which community could show support for each other. Um, so I want to kind of like, in, in, in memoration of like World AIDS Day, and I know there was folks that folks were unable to touch now because of COVID, couldn't go to the hospitals, folks were unable to see loved ones because of fear and stigma. Can we talk a little bit more about like how touch has impacted your life and how touch is important in the radicalization of, of like our public health work. I think I can I share a little bit um, about uh, we was the first again responders to getting getting educated, okay. getting, getting the, the, okay. the edu 
getting the education and getting informed and also to provide um, information about COVID to the general public. We step out first, all the uh, AIDS organizations, uh, we was helping out the most we can to the marginalized and poverty community, the Latinx community, to give him food. Uh, but also, that's the, the uh, really underserved population that uh, we, we live in. Um, unfortunately, we know housing, we know food. A lot of people, we've been losing a lot of transgender people that they died from COVID-19. And we have to do the same thing 30 years ago to go up there and raising funds to bury them. It's been very sad situation okay, uh, right here in the, in the city of Houston about the COVID-19. Um, was this the same emergency that we did 30 years ago, we have to repeat it again. And we was the ones to step out first to helping out the community, like about 30 years ago. I just want to share with you this. And regarding the issue of touch, <clears throat> um, touch for me is an imperative part of the human makeup. And we come from a, we come from a country built on puritanical values where touch through many parts of our communities, especially the community I grew up in. I grew up, I grew up in a white Cajun community in Southern Louisiana. People didn't touch each other. Touch and reinforcement was something I learned after I became an adult and moved into the gay community. It is an imperative part of who we are and it helps us balance ourselves as, as humans. It helps us, it helps us learn um, it helps us learn empathy. It helps us support each other. And on an ongoing basis with COVID, that's becoming impossible. Physical touch is an impossibility at the moment. But what can, is, what can end up happening is we can modify that to the best of our ability for the next however many months it, there is until the vaccine arrives, which could be a while by reaching out in other ways, supplementing, supplementing things that used to require touch would have been easy, an easy tap on the shoulder, a hug, all those things. All those things can be supplemented with, you know, three texts in a row. Are you guys okay? How are you doing? I'm worried about you. Standing at, the, at my doorway and holding my hands in the air and hugging people virtually who are standing at the end of my driveway while we spend 10 minutes talking. That's the best we're gonna do right now and stay safe. But I hope, it is my I, I firm exactly hope, touch. it is my firm hope that we don't end up losing, losing the ability to touch or becoming more becoming scared of touching each other as a result of this epidemic. Because I think that would be a loss for all of us. Thank you. I would like to say that the Wakanda hug would be one of the substitutes that I would offer for folks. The elbow goes up and the arms cross when you want to greet and let people hold. And that is my hug for you. That is the one that we do. That's the Wakanda time. arm and the hug as a substitute for now. It's, to me, it's something that's imperative, the touch. But we have to be aware that at this moment, we have to refrain ourselves to those who live in your same dwelling due to the fact that you not only if you go out and do anything that you're not supposed to, you're not only putting yourself on the way, but those who live in your household. And if we all have somehow achieved to stay put 
in place for a period of at least three weeks. Look at the statistics in other countries. The cases have gone down. And then when the vaccine, as Doc said, finally arrived, then let's have a ball again. But until then, refrain and stay home. And only leave your home when it's imperative either for a doctor's appointment or to buy food. Because everything else is indispensable when you don't have a life. You know, when you die from this COVID, then you have nothing else. But if we as human beings together realize and stay put in place for at least three weeks. And remember that the virus is out there in the air. I am so petrified of it that even when I drive down to my appointments, I wear a mask inside my car because I'd like to drive with my top down. And I have no idea who's going to pass by and sneeze. And it's about protecting myself and my partner who we live together. And it's, it's a must. So please, everybody, be aware of something that simple. Three weeks, let's stop this. And the vaccine should come. And when the vaccine is approved, which hopefully it will be done on the next government because this one I don't believe or trust anything they say because it's like trust me I won't get you pregnant the check is in the mail and I won't come on your mouth it's how many more lives can we take thank you all right that's what a way to end um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. um so uh, with that I am I'm gonna welcome back um Mason um to close it out Thank you. Thank you, Jason. And I, um, you know, prayer hands have become a little bit of a, uh, well, sometimes people you. have a little bit of a mockery. I love the Wakanda greeting. I also love prayer hands. I believe that there is something deeply valuable about bowing to each other. Um, the light in me, the life in me recognizes the light in you. I thank you all so much for participating um, as we, as you all spoke and as anger was manifested at various times, as well as sorrow and grief, I was reminded, um, once again, that I think that the anger born of our journeys and the losses we've experienced, whether it was directly as the result of an epidemic or just growing up as queer people and having to fight our way to a safe place. That anger, I think, continues to be our greatest fuel along with the love that I think is truly our superpower. But I think the love without the anger uh, doesn't have nearly as much power. And anger without love I also agree goes, with you. It can only take us so far. So I wanna thank you all and indeed bow to all of you for your presence here tonight. Thank you for showing up on such an important day for our community. Um, and thank you, Jason, once again, for joining us as moderator. Andrew, can you put up the, the slide one more time? And I will just mention again that Outwards is a nonprofit. We're based in Los Angeles. We are a 501c3. Your donations are completely tax deductible. And today is Giving Tuesday. Your donations allow us and will continue to allow us to record the stories of extraordinary queer elders across the country like the people whom you've heard from today. Um, we believe that their wisdom and their lived experience is transformative uh, for this generation and many generations to come. So I hope you will support us as generously as you are able. And with that, I'll say thank you again for joining us tonight. Stay safe, everyone. Heed the words of our wise panelists. And uh, we will see you again uh, very soon. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, holidays. Happy, happy holidays. Merry everyone. Christmas. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thanks. Happy holidays, <laughs> yes. Well, to everybody. And stay home.
<laughs> There's no place like home. Stay safe, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Stay Thank safe. you, everyone.